Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars share Iowa stories and the history of the state through a cultural history lens on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today, we will learn about the relationship between rural law as, as experienced in rural communities and the myth of the country lawyer through the eyes of Charles Pendleton, a lawyer who practiced from the 1920s through the 1970s in Storm Lake. We will also consider how the myth of the community lawyer continued to obscure longstanding access to justice problems in rural communities in the 21st century. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague, Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation but please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Emily Preifogel. Emily is an assistant professor of law at the University of Michigan Law School and an assistant professor of history by courtesy. She has a law degree from the University of California, Berkeley, a PhD in history from Princeton University, and a master's in comparative social policy from Oxford. Her research focuses broadly on social history of the law and includes a study of place, gender, and sexuality, and race. She is currently working on a book project about the legal remaking of rural communities in the Midwest during the 20th century. Her work has already received awards from the American Society for Legal History, the Association of Study of Law, Culture, and Humanities, and the Law and Society Organization. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Emily to begin the webinar. Jennifer, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm so grateful to be here with you today. Thank you for those of you who are listening today. I'm going to turn off my video so that we can see the screen here and uh, start up this slide. So I'm just going to jump in. We still know relatively little about the 20th century rural legal practice and how it works. We know far less um, than what historians know about the 18th and 19th century uh, lawyers and legal practice, whether that's rural or otherwise. When conjuring an idea of what rural lawyers do day to day, often members of the profession and the American population more broadly fill this gap with the myth of the country lawyer. Today, I'm gonna to spend around 45 minutes talking about the myths and realities of the country lawyer in the Midwest. Much of what I'll discuss I learned in the course of writing an article published in the Annals of Iowa called Winks, Whispers, and Prosecutorial Discretion. In that article, I relied on the memoirs of a lawyer named Charles Pendleton to tell a story about rural legal practice. Charles Pendleton was one of many Midwestern country lawyers who wrote about their experiences in self-published and unpublished memoirs. Today, I wanna to go beyond what is in my article to talk about these memoirs and reflections alongside some social science research on rural lawyers. I'll use the country lawyers' memoirs as an entry point into the tangled relationship between rural law as practiced and experienced in rural communities and the myth of the country lawyer that shaped many Americans' conceptualization of rural legal practice throughout the 20th century. So in light of that, before I go further, I want to acknowledge that today I'll be discussing instances of racial discrimination and sexual assault as described by the rural lawyers in their memoirs. My talk will span from 1920 to the present, but it's useful to keep the late 1960s and 1970s in mind while I talk. In part, that's because when men, that's when many of these lawyers were writing their memoirs about their careers in the earlier period, in the 20s, the 30s, 40s, and even 50s. But also the 1960s and 1970s are when social scientists also started paying attention to rural lawyers for the first time. And they give us a different glimpse into the myths and realities of the country lawyer. 
The country lawyer is an idealized version of the lawyer in American culture, especially when we think of men like Abraham Lincoln or Atticus Finch, Paul Beigler or Ephraim Tutt. They are often invoked as the very soul of integrity, a man totally committed to fairness and justice. The country lawyer is a white middle-aged man who dispenses with an avuncular mix of wisdom and good humor while maintaining a generalist legal practice in a small town where he is deeply connected to the community in part through gossip and he is trusted and respected by the townspeople. The country lawyer archetype picks up on very real experiences of rural lawyers. They have been and still are mostly white men. They have been and still are deeply embedded in small communities where anonymity is virtually non-existent. And their generalist practices and civic engagement have been and still are benefits to their communities. The myth of the country lawyer though might lead one to believe that everyone in rural towns get a fair shake. So if you think of Atticus Finch's defense of Tom Robinson, for example, but the archetype also obscures equally real, long-standing access to justice problems in rural communities. And this is what I'm really interested in talking to you about today. Country lawyers have acted as community problem solvers with tremendous amounts of power to determine whether any individual rural resident has access to the formal legal system. So let me introduce you to Charles Pendleton. Here is a photo from his Georgetown Law uh, law school yearbook. And Charles Pendleton really tried to embody the myth of the country lawyer in his memoirs. And those memoirs are going to serve as our entry point now. Charles Pendleton graduated from Georgetown Law School in 1920 and promptly took up practice in his home county of Buena Vista um, in Iowa. At, at first, he was the lone lawyer, the only lawyer in Sioux Rapids for a few years. And then he becomes the county prosecutor, the only prosecutor in Storm Lake, just a few years after he left school. Pendleton made a name for himself by pursuing trial work whenever possible. In rural places in the 1920s, trials were forms of entertainment, not unlike watching a play in the local auditorium. As such, a new lawyer like Pendleton could display his abilities and advertise his services at trial. So with a passion for theater and stage, Pendleton seized the opportunities of trial work. He approached the courtroom as a stage on which to display his erudition and his legal acumen, as well as his flair for grand oratory. So take, for example, one of his early efforts in the trial of Robert Grubb in 1921. Pendleton served as defense counsel for Grubb, who had been charged with stealing thousands of dollars in cash from an elderly man who actually was quite unpopular in the community. The victim, Hans Johnson, was known for his miserliness, and he, you know, according to community gossip, had buried over $50,000 in cash and gold on his property. Um, Pendleton recounted in his memoir that he actually insisted that Grubb have a preliminary hearing in front of a justice of a peace. That's actually a, a waivable step in the process, but he told his client that he was simply not willing to waive this procedural step because the people of this community are entitled to attend the hearing because there is so very little entertainment in this village. Seemingly most concerned then with his chance to display his abilities, Pendleton secured the stage, quite literally. The preliminary hearing was held in Sioux Rapids Star Theater. That was the movie house on Main Street. The local paper uh, had a headline that announced the, when the hearing would be held, and that ensured what Pendleton called a sold out audience. And Pendleton mused that if, quote, the spectators were allowed to vote, they would have returned a verdict of not guilty. But he wasn't so lucky. The grand jury returned an indictment against Grubb. Then at trial, Pendleton, according to Pendleton, gave his opening and closing arguments to the first jury in the county to include women and to a courtroom audience that was standing room only. In his writings, he described at length the verbal sparring between him and his legal opponent. He was proud of his closing remarks, which lasted two hours, during which he, quote, again, 
orated with never a pause for breath and illustrated with quotations from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, the 26th Psalm, and many other literary masterpieces. It left an impression. Even the judge shook hands with Pendleton. Um, Pendleton says, as though I was a batter that had just hit a home run for the home team. So all of this was enough, apparently, to convince the jury to find Grubb not guilty. The community was delighted with Pendleton's success and the trial's outcome. But rumors spread quickly, not just of Pendleton's talents, but also that it was the women on the jury that forced the verdict. But lest those rumors of an easily convinced female jury tarnish his success, Pendleton disputed them in his memoirs as he wrote them decades, almost half a century later, writing that there were 10 men on that jury and that his stellar closing argument had, of course, convinced more men than women. So in Pendleton's memoir, um, this is a theme. Women are never portrayed positively. And perhaps that's not unexpected for the times in which he practiced and later wrote his memoirs. But I think a careful reading of his and other country lawyers' memoirs reveals how gender played an important role in dictating access to the legal system in rural communities for much of the 20th century. One of the clearest views we have into the way that Pendleton acted as a gatekeeper of legal access in his rural community is presented by the cases of domestic strife. Infidelity and divorce were common in Buena Vista County where Pendleton practiced. Often it was clear to Pendleton that one partner to the marriage had been wronged. So for example, he talks about, quote, a wholesome country maid who was, and here's another quote, a real looker and rarity for our town. Um, and she was left by her husband who was having a baby with a woman in a nearby city. In this type of case, Pendleton steered this category of cases into the civil courts as a routine part of his practice. So if it looks like it's a case for divorce, send it to the courts. Um, but Pendleton was generally successful in steering cases involving uh, violations of traditional family norms out of the courts. So for instance, in the case of an expectant mother, Pendleton was called one evening to act. A roughneck, according to Pendleton, uh, from the country had a sister-in-law who was, quote, in trouble. That meant she was pregnant, but the father did not intend to marry her. Pendleton swore out a warrant for seduction, but he actually never intended to follow through on that criminal charge. It was merely an instrument to extract the desired end, which he called a pop gun marriage. He also steered cases of serious domestic violence out of the court system. Pendleton was once called to the Central Hotel boarding house to deal with a domestic dispute there. He observed amid squalor and poverty, a couple who he called, quote, a big chim chimpanzee of a man and a strange woman of the night. And both of them together had a daughter who was with them. He had actually seen the mother and daughter at his church the night before on Christmas Eve, where they were there to receive some free food and a stocking for the daughter. But in this context of the boarding house, the woman and girl appeared far less deserving of pity, according to Pendleton. He recounted the conversation he had with the couple. He asks, what's the meaning of all this rumpus? Oh, he's in one of his usual crazy rages. She stuck me with a hat pin when all I was doing was copying up to her in bed. Go on, what else is the cause of this disturbance? You can see Pendleton being the rational one here in this portrayal. Then the man says again, I slapped her and she hit me over the head with a rolling pin and I didn't come to for 45 minutes. And then she retorts, he's a damn liar. He came within five minutes after I hit him. And I think as readers, we're supposed to laugh there that this is the joke, um, although it's hard to from our vantage point. Pendleton's memoirs don't include much more about what happened that night, except that there were no charges brought against either the man or the woman. He simply told his reader that the community peace was preserved by moving the couple to a cottage at the edge of town. Noting that the man's violence against the woman apparently had not stopped, 
Pendleton told his reader that the woman fled with her very few possessions um, in tow, while the quote, human dynamo was in hot pursuit. Pendleton seemed quite glad to be rid of the couple and relatively unconcerned for the safety of the woman or the girl. Observing that Sioux Rapids population took a loss, the town's peace and quiet got an assist, he said. Now the nature of memoirs means that we as readers are reliant on Pendleton's perspective into these events. And often because Pendleton omits specific dates and sometimes full names, although sometimes I have their full names, it's not always possible to verify these family law narratives that he presents in his memoirs. Still, his recollections about encounters with feuding spouses reveal how much power rural lawyers like him had to shape access to legal remedies. From Pendleton's perspective, the legal process was most apt to handle divorces that in turn enabled remarriage and enforcement of male support. But for other types of domestic disputes, especially those that could carry criminal charges for men, he used his legal knowledge to steer the conflict out of the court system. Fathers were forced to marry unwed mothers, assertive wives or abused women were shrugged off as simple everyday problems. Neither type of these kind of conflicts warranted legal intervention. Pendleton was not particularly delicate or even sympathetic to those involved in these kind of cases either. So even if we assume as we should that Pendleton was idiosyncratic, his perspective on domestic disputes mattered a great deal for those who saw access to the courts because he was either the sole lawyer in town, for example, when he practiced in Sioux Rapids, or he was the lone county prosecutor in Storm Lake for the later half of the 20, 1920s. So community norms around gender roles mattered a great deal in determining whether Pendleton either held the doors open to the courts, threatened criminal sanction, or ignored the problem as a local trouble that didn't necessitate a legal remedy. But it wasn't just gender norms that shaped Pendleton's practice of the law. Race mattered a great deal too. And that's because in small towns, there's not much exaggeration to the statement that everyone knows everyone. Gossip was and remains a powerful form of social sanction in rural communities with very little anonymity. Gossip about Pendleton shaped his behavior as an individual, as a private lawyer, and as a prosecutor. As an individual, he worried about doing a kind deed for a black woman who needed a ride, lest some Ku Klux Klan member might accuse him of cavorting with black women. And as county attorney, he constantly navigated gossip and accusations from both the Klan and anti-Klan constituencies in town. Both groups claimed that he had favored the other over them. So this lack of anonymity in rural communities, it's what sociologists call a high density of social acquaintance. It also shaped both Pendleton's practice and community members access to legal services and the justice system. So I, I want to um, show you another example here. And this is um, a story that Pendleton tells about the time when a group of ostensibly Mexican or Mexican American migrant workers approached Pendleton for help with their labor contract. From Pendleton's perspective, he was a lawyer for the underdogs and these were certainly underdog clients. Yet the story he told reveals how conflicts of interest could block the courtroom doors for community outsiders. So the family enters his office which is housed in the courthouse, and perhaps they're looking to secure his services as a private lawyer, or perhaps they're seeking the assistance of the county attorney, but either way, they tell Pendleton their plight. Through a young boy in the group who acts as interpreter, Pendleton learns that Jim Little had hired this family to weed his cornfields. The family had not yet been paid. They were forced to sleep in hog pens, and they wanted to leave for better pay and working conditions in Iowa's beet fields. So they sought Pendleton help to secure the wages that they were already owed for the work they had already completed. Pendleton's first inclination was that the 
uh, proffered employment from this family would be, quote, awkward for him. And that's because Judge Deland both owned Jim Little's tenant farm and served as the sole county judge in whose courtroom Pendleton practiced each day. Yet he still offered to take the matter up with Judge Deland, who Pendleton expected would simply order the wages paid. But instead, Deland insisted otherwise. The contract was indivisible, meaning that the family was not entitled to any pay until the entire contract was completed, until all of the weeds were hoed. Pendleton explained it this way to the Spanish speaking family. This is the ranchero. He is a great and good judge, and he has ruled that he and his tenant will pay every peso of your agreement to hoe out all of the weeds, otherwise they will not pay. The boy then translated his grandfather's response for Pendleton and Deland. We poor Mexicans will not hoe another weed on mean Americans ranch. They can steal our wages from us, but they cannot make us sleep with their worn out hog house. Pendleton simply observed in his memoirs that after this exchange, the family left the center of American justice like a flock of jabbering blackbirds. The story recounted in Pendleton's memoir is complicated and troubling for many reasons. First, it highlights how a country lawyer could be called upon to act as a mediator rather than an advocate for a single party. Pendleton actually never formally accepted the family as clients. He intimated in his memoir that his personal sympathies were largely with this migrant family, but he knew it would be politically unwise, awkward in his words, to formally advocate for the family through legal proceedings. As told in the memoir, when he offered the family to take the matter up with the judge, he appeared to be navigating two things. First, a sense that a wrong, whether it was legally cognizable or not, had been perpetrated alongside another sense that taking up the case would probably damage his reputation and success as a lawyer in his community and among his local bar. Thus, the mediation he proffered had a foregone conclusion. He ostensibly accepted the judge's straightforward, even if informal, application of what's called the entirety's doctrine to the labor contract. Second, the account is representative of how a community member's outside status could influence their ability to access legal services. In part, Pendleton is marking their outsider status for his reader by using this broken English. But Pendleton also writes that the judge, quote, ruled on their case, even though there was no formal case or proceeding. Pendleton told his readers that the family left, quote, the center of American justice, with what I have to read as a tinge of irony because the family had not actually accessed the formal court system at all. Pendleton listened to the family's complaints and sorted it into a category of local trouble rather than a legal problem. And he steered it out of the formal court system. These nameless potential litigants were prevented from bringing a claim in court in part because of their outsider status and also in part because of the insider status of the tenant farmer and the landowner. Then third, the migrant worker account here underscores the role, importantly, of racial identity, specifically in shaping rural access to justice. Migrant workers were a frequent and necessary presence in rural Iowa and in much of the Midwest. But migrant worker attempts to claim contract rights are far less um, frequently found in the legal archive. So while the rural population in Storm Lake and rural Iowa um, generally was overwhelmingly white, rural Iowa residents, including Charles Pendleton, were not without a sense of racial and ethnic, what I'm going to call imaginary, that shaped themselves, their communities, and importantly, the role of law and lawyers. That is what is on display here. When we talk about um, this case of migrant workers, it's on display in how Pendleton um, uses broken English to describe his encounter with this migrant family. So Pendleton believed 
that down through the ages, lawyers have always made the law livable. And for Pendleton, that's what he aimed to do as a public servant um, and as a private lawyer and as a community member. Uh, this is what he aimed to do when he steered certain charges out of the criminal justice system, when he sought fines instead of sentences for prohibition infractions. It's what he sought to do when he found alternative arrangements for drunk doctors and pregnant women. It's just that the law was made more livable for some in his community than for others. Pendleton's memoirs demonstrate the scope and limitations of the law to do the work of reconstituting and reinforcing rural norms more broadly too. Pendleton observed, at least in hindsight, that the small communities surrounding the county seat often preferred to handle the local problems without the involvement of the county prosecutor. All things considered, while Pendleton was the sole legal representative for the county, he was not the sole arbiter of conflict for the county. Other leaders in the community, such as mayors, doctors, and my favorite, even psychics, provided advice and social services alongside Pendleton as a lawyer. They too made the law livable in their own way, but also for some more than others. Now, scholars of rural American communities have found that individual community members often express their understanding of social norms through identifying transgressive behavior, behavior of outsiders to the community. So for example, who brought which legal claims could mark the social boundaries between insiders and outsiders, even within a single residential community? Social boundaries in a rural community required active safeguarding and maintenance, which included stigmatizing certain types of legal actions brought by certain types of people. Doing so was a way for residents of a community to exclude from their moral universe what they could not exclude from the physical boundaries of their community. Pendleton's exercise of legal discretion similarly maintained those social boundaries, marking who was in, who was out, all based on who could bring which claims in front of the law. Pendleton's portrayal of himself and his memoirs fit the mold of the country lawyer archetype in American law. He wasn't alone. Other country lawyers drafted and self-published their own memoirs too. Memoirs of rural lawyers who practiced in the 1930s through the 1960s, like those of George Keller, who practiced in Michigan, and Irvin Grant, who practiced in rural Kansas, also conform to the country lawyer myth in similar ways to Pendleton's memoirs, one of which is titled At the Home Front in War and Life. So when Pendleton wrote his memoirs in the 1960s, America had just kind of come off of this um, period of celebrating the country lawyer through film characters like Atticus Finch, from To Kill a Mockingbird in 1962, and Paul Beigler from Anatomy of a Murder in 1959. Before Finch and Beigler, it was a lionized Abraham Lincoln, like I mentioned before, who stood, and perhaps still does stand for some people, as the quintessential country lawyer. Charles Pendleton, as well as Keller and Grant, relied on these stereotypes that men like Lincoln, Finch, and Beigler represented as rural lawyers in order to structure their own memoirs and to interpret their own experience of legal practice. So the film Anatomy of a Murder in particular served as an implicit and explicit guide for how the rural lawyers and memoir, memoir writers expressed themselves. There were small things like how all of the memoirs touted opportunities for rural recreation, including camping, hunting, and fishing as one of the draws of rural legal practice. But there's also far less benign connections between the film and their memoirs as well. The publicly celebrated and created archetype of the country lawyer influenced how rural lawyers thought of themselves. The celebrated aspects of the archetype also concealed or papered over more pernicious aspects of rural justice. There are many possible examples that we could examine to talk about the relationship between the country lawyer myth and the realities of country lawyer practice. But I want to discuss George Keller of Michigan, who set out to explicitly draw parallels in his own memoir between the film Anatomy of a Murder and a case in Michigan in which he defended a man accused of rape. 
For those of you who are not familiar with the 1959 film, Anatomy of a Murder, it's actually based on a 1958 novel. And it was written by a rural Michigan lawyer who wrote the account based on a very real representation of the defendant accused of murder. In the book and movie, a humble and cunning country lawyer named Paul Beegler defends an army lieutenant who certainly did actually murder the victim, but the lawyer, played by Jimmy Stewart, cleverly uses an insanity fence to get the lieutenant off. In his memoir, Keller titled one chapter, Anatomy of a Rape. He situated himself as the quintessential country lawyer, navigating the technical details of the law to prove the innocence of a man accused of rape, just like the astute lawyer in the movie. In Keller's eight-page narrative about his real-life case, he mobilized several aspects of the country lawyer myth, starting with the rural lawyer's love of hunting and fishing. He observed that urban lawyers across the country were oblivious about the rural practice that he, that he knew, except for their knowledge of the beautiful Marquette County Circuit Courthouse, which served as the set of anatomy of a murder. In his telling, Keller got it in his mind that he needed to try a case there. Fancying himself Jimmy Stewart, who played the defense attorney in the film, Keller jumped at the chance to take over a case as the defense attorney for a man charged with rape. Underscoring the difficulty and triumph of his ultimate win, Keller noted that his co-counsel had opined it was an impossible case to defend. The facts of the case were straightforward and undisputed. George Edward was a 32-year-old truck driver who had come uninvited to a party of 19 and 20-year-olds. Ostensibly, he entered a young woman's bedroom after the party, slapped her across the face, and then had sex with her. She reported the encounter as rape immediately after he left. She then became pregnant. The local community, understandably so, held deep resentment against the truck driver. Playing on the trope of the country lawyer's courtroom performance, Keller instead focuses his narrative not on the facts of the case, but on the drama at trial, which he called, quote, an astonishing spectacle, a spectacle that he spent most of his several pages of text capturing. The spectacle started in the courtroom which, as I said, had been the, the set for the film um, and which Keller called magnificent. In Keller's telling, his defense tried to mimic the defense of the murdered defendant in the film. That is, he argued that the defendant was flawed as an adulterer, but technically under the law, the defendant was not a rapist. He solicited testimony from the defendant at trial that the girl had stood at the head of the stairs and beckoned him. And that um, at one point when the girl protested, the man slapped her for, quote, playing cat and mouse with him, and then went on to have intercourse, quote, with her full consent. Keller even called the defendant's wife to the stand, who testified that indeed he was a horrible husband, but he wasn't a liar. He always told the truth. Then in closing arguments, Keller told the jury that indeed his client was, quote, a rake and a philanderer who was unfaithful to his wife and was worthy of absolutely no sympathy. But then he explicitly referenced the anatomy of a murder film to the jury and pointed out that the facts of this case did not rise to a rape. He said the jury could not convict him for rape. He instructed the jury instead to quote, limit themselves to the definition of a profile of an anatomy of a rape. And if they agreed with him, they must find the defendant not guilty, end quote. The jury, which Keller claimed was composed of the same ratio of men and women as the jury in Anatomy of a Murder, returned a verdict for assault, but not rape. Keller's goal of trying to replicate a cunning courtroom win akin to that performed by Jimmy Stewart had been achieved. He even seemed to revel in his client's dissatisfaction with his services, much like the defendant in the film who stiffed his attorney and left town before paying his fees. Keller's closing words on the subject were, and again, I quote, 
I was paid a small fee, but I never wrote the sequel, Anatomy of a Rape. Possibly I should have, end quote. In his chapter on anatomy of a rape, Keller made explicit what had been otherwise implicit in his and other country lawyers' memoirs. This country lawyer myth encompassed a humble, generalist, masculine practice, deeply embedded with a tightly knit, gossipy community that purported to be an ideal of American justice, while the reality of rural legal practice for much of the 20th century very much failed to live up to that ideal. In the telling of the court cases, both cinematic and in real life, the trauma experienced by the women was secondary to the country lawyer's triumph in court with his superior maneuvering and oratory. Keller didn't take the case out of some moral sense of pursuing justice or giving all defendants a fair defense. He took the case because he wanted to play Jimmy Stewart for a day. He even wrote in his memoir that he had forgotten, long forgotten the name of his co-counsel on the case, but he did remember that the co-counsel had known the author of Anatomy of a Murder. And Keller was tempted to ask his co-counsel to invite the author to attend the trial in order to quote, secure a follow-up script for the sequel movie. So I wanna pause here for, just a moment to highlight a couple of things. First, the comparison between the men's memoirs and To Kill a Mockingbird would raise similar dissonance between a purported commitment to serving all community members and a pattern of legal representation that very much took race into account. Second, um, the Keller example also shows how the country lawyer myth persisted from the time that Pendleton practiced in the 1920s all the way through the 1960s when Keller is trying to recreate um, his own anatomy of a murder case. And then third, if we had time for more examples today, we'd see how the memoirs embody the country lawyer by emphasizing themes like a reverence for oratory and trial practice, physical and social presence at the very heart of the community, rural recreation, political involvement, a gendered sense of legal practice, gossip and a lack of anonymity, the importance of reputation, and both a dedication to the underdog client and a simultaneous reluctance to take on locally controversial cases. I hope what comes from the examples I've shown you is that the memoirs of rural lawyers make clear that there was no golden era of legal access to the, uh, rural justice as portrayed by Jimmy Stewart or Gregory Peck. Now, it wasn't long after this era of cinematic celebration of the country lawyer, the academics in the legal profession started to notice that something was amiss in rural legal access. Alan Whitus was one of the scholars who took notice of rural legal needs. In 1970, he published a study on legal assistance in rural Iowa. His findings were striking. He found that over 80% of those families living below the poverty line lived outside of the state's five metropolitan areas. But it was those metropolitan areas, of course, where federally funded legal aid offices were located. Despite having two thirds of the state's population, rural communities had only half of Iowa's practicing lawyers. Worse, why does a survey estimated that perhaps as much as 22 to 30% of Iowa's rural residents could not afford legal services at all? resulting in perhaps as many as 15% of rural individuals not seeking such services when they were needed. The Iowa study also found that these numbers did not account for the approximately 3,000 migrant workers who came through Iowa each year who had unique needs for legal services in housing and employment law. Scholars like Whitus were worried that rural people didn't look to the law as a remedy for their problems. And even if their problems might implicate the law, either because they didn't have the funds to pay for a lawyer or they lacked knowledge about their rights. Um, but rural lawyers might also have impeded the ability of poor rural residents to access the legal system too. In Iowa specifically, White has found that rural lawyers did not provide at least some free legal aid to down on their luck community members. They provided some, um, at reduced rates or without cost for clients who are unable to pay normal charges. 
But White House observed that many country lawyers, despite believing that it was part of their civic duty as a rural lawyer to help those who could not afford legal services, reported that they routinely turned away cases in which a potential client could not pay for services. Country lawyers in rural communities favored an informal system in which private lawyers provided legal services at their discretion, giving them power over who in their community could access the courts. So I think we've already seen lots of this in the examples that I talked about um, earlier with Keller with Pendleton. But even, Wyda says, when individuals paid for rural legal representation, he was worried about the quality of representation they might receive. It turns out that rural lawyers, at least during this time, um, were unsurprisingly physically far away from the very well curated legal libraries that were housed in urban hubs. Only 63% of Nebraska lawyers, for example, in 1974, had access to decisions from the Supreme Court of the United States, only 63%. Only 22% reported having access to um, decisions from other states and other federal courts. Even fewer had access to things like law reviews and treaties. All of these things, these are what make up the core materials that lawyers rely on routinely in their practice. That same study of Nebraska lawyers found that 40% of the state's prosecutors had less than five years total experience. That was Pendleton. And appointments for indigenous, indigenous defense cases in rural counties routinely went to some of the most inexperienced lawyers as well. Even rural judges reported that they didn't have the time nor the research assistance to do what was necessary to decide the cases before them. Now, you might not be surprised um, to find out that even though research like Widus' study of rural lawyers in Iowa reported troubling disparities in access to rural justice, the academic publications, the stuff that I write, had little effect on continued perpetuation of the country lawyer myth and conditions in rural communities. So I wanna close my remarks today by telling you why I think the history that I discussed is relevant to the challenges of rural lawyers today. Right now, in the 21st century, there is an alarming shortage of rural lawyers. Nationwide, only 2% of the country's law practices are in rural communities, where about 20% of the total population lives. Now, I've spent most of my time today talking about how rural lawyers had and have enormous powers as gatekeepers to justice in their communities. And I've even argued that we should be skeptical about taking the country lawyer myth at face value and the quality of access to justice um, in rural communities. But what I don't wanna leave you with today is an impression that um, the specific lawyers I discussed, nor rural lawyers as a whole, aren't important contributors to their communities. Rural lawyers are important uh, parts of their healthy rural communities, and a dearth of rural lawyers doesn't solve issues of unequal access to the courts in rural communities. We need systemic solutions, and many states are developing initiatives to increase the number of rural lawyers, and that's great. But at least some of them are relying on the country lawyer myth in the process. So for example, a modern day Atticus Finch has helped inspire South Dakota's modern rural practice. And I'm, and I'm quoting there when I say a modern day Atticus Finch. The program provides incentives to lure attorneys to the state's rural counties. During one of the project's very first efforts to connect law students to rural legal practice, the country lawyer who inspired the initiative dispensed with what he called prairie wisdom as a country lawyer to these law students. And one woman law student expressed concern over whether she would be able to sustain a, sustain a practice in that community. She asked this modern day Atticus Finch whether she'd be here all alone. Would she know what to do there? Um, and the response she received from this longtime male country lawyer was that she could, quote, thrive in the new frontier um, if she just simply developed trust and worked hard. And he dismissed this idea that location had anything to do with a viable legal practice. Instead, the student was told by him that, quote, the answer depends on who the lawyer is and the attributes of that person, 
right? Like it's the, it's the idea of the country lawyer, it's the attributes of the country lawyer that allows them to succeed. Um, and although answers like these are meant to be encouraging, they ignore the very real challenges of rural legal practice in the 21st century. Um, just two of them are um, a lack of adequate financial support, the high cost of maintaining a practice in rural places, as well as social isolation. These answers continue to incorporate the myth of the country lawyer. And to me, I see that as the legal equivalent of the myth of the Yeoman farmer, this white man with an independent spirit who sticks to his principles, all while serving as the backbone of the community through his entrepreneurial endeavors. But just as the imagined Yeoman farmer couldn't make it in the 20th century, neither could the imagined country lawyer. So what I've tried to show you today is that when we look at what real rural lawyers were really doing in the 20th century, we see a very different world than the one imagined in the archetype of the country lawyer. Um, without histories of 20th century rural lawyers, the country lawyer myth has and will continue to fill in the gaps in public perception and in policy, perpetuating this idea that rural places are places with an ideal justice system. And by that, I mean an ideal that is summed up as a justice system that is locally rooted, often avoided. And when it does um, have to be encountered by an individual, that individual is shepherded or navigated through the justice system by the ideal lawyer. And that's someone who is humble, honest, and connected to the community. The perpetuation of this imagined rural legal community has obscured very real gaps and inequalities in the rural justice system and has concealed our responsibilities to address that problem as well. There are some things that the myth gets right. The geography and structure of rural community life shapes distinct legal needs of rural residents and importantly, the available legal and non-legal approaches to problem solving. And that's great, that's okay. Um, we also know that in rural communities, there will continue to be lawyers and community leaders who act as sorters and gatekeepers and watchdogs who filter out local troubles from cognizable legal claims using local norms and customs. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that either. But as we set out to solve this rural lawyer shortage, we have to keep the past top of mind. Any rural legal initiatives must ensure that all residents including women, new migrant communities, low income residents, and native populations have equitable access to the legal system. And so it is with that, um, that I think I will close and leave you with that thought. Again, I just wanna thank you for listening today and I'm really looking forward to answering all of your questions. Well, thank you, Emily. Uh, we have some time to answer questions. If you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A feature right here on Zoom. Um, but please note, we may not be able to get to all the questions before we end. And let's start. And Emily, I'm very interested to find out, how did you find out about Charles Pendleton? Um, luck. So um, for all the historians on the call, they will know that finding a good archive is really difficult. And all of my work, my book project works on um, rural legal history. So a lot of it is luck and striking out a lot. Um, but I saw in the, you know, um, catalog of the Iowa Historical Society that there's some guy named Charles Pendleton and he was a lawyer and he had some papers there. And so I um, jumped on the chance to go to Iowa City and look through his papers. And it was just pure luck. But I will say, you know, one thing that's really lovely about Charles Pendleton and his memoirs is he, from a historian's perspective, I should say, I mean, he, he seems like a really great guy too. He was, he fought the Klan. He, he did a lot of really fantastic things um, in his community. He was a great um, civic member of his community. But his memoirs, he wrote, I'm gonna say at least five off the top of my head, memoirs in excruciating detail about his practice from 1920 to about 1970. And he used real names. And so the fact that these were unpublished, he, he self-published one of his memoirs, but many of them are just manuscripts that he drafted from his, his home office. And so he used real names. So even though a lot of times like the dates are murky or the last name's not there, um, so I can't always go double check everything. I love as a historian that he gave me lots of real names. I can't imagine him being able to kind of, 
to publish this in a, in a way that his, his fellow community members might have read. He gave away a lot of secrets. Um, and so as a source, it's been really fantastic to work with his, his memoirs. Um, he's given me a lot to work with and, and it's been lovely to get to kind of know him in the process as well. That's great. And, actually, and along with the idea of talking about sources, um, did you have a favorite source you found while doing your research? It's um, hard, I know. I know it's very hard. Um, let me think about this. So I, if, I, if I could talk about some of Pendleton's sources, one of the, my favorite stories that he tells is actually in the article, but I didn't tell it today. And it's about, um, it's about a case where a police officer is accused of sodomy. And um, it's really, it's, it's my favorite source, um, not necessarily because it tells a story of, of how a community is gossiping over um, this man who, who may or may not um, be gay. It's very unclear, but very rarely in my research in rural communities do I get folks talking about sexuality. Um, it's, it's often reading between the lines, but Pendleton lays it all out for me. Uh, he talks about how the community saw it. It's all, of course, through Pendleton's eyes, but um, that I think is just, I don't know that I'll get to find something as revealing as that again. And so I think as, as far as this lawyer, lawyer chapter that I'm working on, I think that's probably my favorite story of Charles Pendleton's just because he gives this insight into a, a probably vibrant existing gay community in this rural community that often doesn't come through in our archives because it's something that was, was not to be spoken about, um, but that I get to see in this, in this archival source. That's fantastic. I have to add that the name Charles Pendleton sounds like a fictional movie lawyer name too, which perfect. Um, next question. Um, is there an indication that Charles Pendleton's religious beliefs affected his work as a lawyer, especially in the 1920s and early 1930s? It does a lot. I talk about this a little bit um, in the article. So Charles Pendleton grew up as a Catholic, and then he converts um, to be a Methodist after he starts um, practicing law. And it's unclear why he converts. Um, it sounds like he wasn't really much of a practicing Catholic, except that, you know, his mother took him um, to church uh, when he was a young boy. And he, of course, went to Georgetown Law, which is, which is a Catholic law school. Um, and very few people, in fact, Charles Pendleton is the only member of his bar that went to law school and then came back and practiced. At this time, everybody else is still apprenticing and passing the local bar without kind of going to a formal law school. And um, so the reason why I say I'm not sure why Pendleton converted um, is because the Klan in the 1920s, especially places like Iowa and rural Iowa, of course, the Klan is racist, but mostly what they were concerned about were Catholics. And much of Pendleton's career as a county prosecutor is navigating um, the Klan. He is enforcing prohibition and he is trying to... Um, both support Catholic community members who feel harassed by the Klan because he is ardently anti-Klan, um, but at the same time, he is reliant on Klan community members to vote him into office. And so he is trying to navigate this line of enforcing prohibition, but not allowing Klan rhetoric to be openly practiced in the community. So religion certainly influences, I think, everything from you know where he chose to go to law school to um, to how he practices as a, as a county attorney during the height of the Klan in the 1920s. Our next question is a, a two-parter. And um, you talked about the impact that Charles Pendleton had on certain cases by moving them forward to court or bringing them uh, to different outcomes outside the court system. Um, how does that change a community? these two types of ways of bringing cases and finding justice. And what happens when a rural lawyer retires or there's a change to the law or societal change? Yeah, um, so where to start about that? I mean, I think it really, I'm not the only rural scholar to kind of look at this phenomenon. Rural scholars have kind of looked at the way rural communities make these lines up about what cases should go to court and what cases shouldn't go to court. So if anybody's from a rural community, you can, probably imagine a couple from your own community. Um, 
a scholar named Engel studies a farm community in Iowa, or I'm sorry, Illinois in the 1980s. And he says that farmers don't bring contract claims to court, or excuse me, they do bring contract claims to court. So if you shake on something, like that is something that is enforceable in court. That's a norm that's enforced in court. But he says that tort cases, so injury cases, are never brought to court because that's just understood in the community that you're going to help out on somebody else's farm and you might get injured while you're helping them on the farm. And that's something that the community is going to help take care of, not something that you need to bring the law into. So these norms manifest in different ways in different rural communities, um, but it certainly also shapes who are insiders and who are outsiders. So in Ingalls' example, um, a large Latino population moves in to this rural community and they're outsiders. And they are outsiders in part because they want to bring um, claims for work injuries um, because of course the community is not supporting them when they get injured. So they need to go to court to enforce the, those kind of support claims. And um, that's also marking who's an insider and an outsider. So the insider and outsider status is both marking which claims get brought to court and then it's reifying, right? What kind of claims go to court? Mark again, who's an insider and an outsider. Um, there's a second part of that question that I really wanted to answer and now I forgot what the second part was. I'm sorry. You're okay, give me one. I'll pull it up here one second. Um, what happens when a rural lawyer retires or there's a change to the law or a societal change? Yeah, I mean, the quirkiness changes, right? Um, Keller truly believed that it was the woman's fault if there was a uh, divorce and he refused to take divorce cases. So, you know, when Keller is not one of the few lawyers in his rural community anymore, I imagine that there's more folks that can go to a local lawyer for divorce instead of, you know, in the 60s, you know, you could probably... Um, roads are better, right? So you can find a lawyer outside of your immediate community. Um, so the quirkiness of, you know, access does change. Although I think there are some things that are stable, right? The quirkiness, it's not quirky that gender is actually dictating in some form who gets to go to court, who doesn't, that race is dictating in some form. Um, but then there's also things like prohibition is a really good example with Pendleton. The law changes, right? Like there's no prohibition, you can drink, and then there's prohibition. And Pendleton is an is a insider in his community. And he's forced with saying like, look, there's a lot of Germans in our community and I know that you're going to continue to homebrew beer. And he's got to navigate this new law and try to incorporate it into his community in a way that's acceptable. Um, so the way that he does that is he um, asks for fines instead of jail sentences. Keep on brewing, you just got to pay the fine. Think of it as a tax, right? But the law itself, prohibition, um, the Iowa state law, it tries to stop that by incentivizing the um, county prosecutor to enforce it by giving him um, uh, a fee every time that he prosecutes a prohibition case, right? So there's lots of forces at work when a, when a law changes like that. Sometimes the law knows it, that the rural lawyer might not want to enforce something unpopular in his community. And so it, it adds an incentive to the law to, um, to make sure that it happens. And, and Pendleton tried his best to, to kind of navigate those changes. Perfect, thank you. We are running up on time. Um, so that actually will be our last question today. But, but thank you, Emily. We really appreciate you being here with us today. I, I say it's a lot, but I think we can all agree this has been a, a very informative lunch for all of us who joined. Thank you. Thanks for coming today. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to everyone joining us today. We would like to extend or one last thank you again to Emily. Thank you again. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays uh, throughout the year. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available um, on the website as well. While you're there, you can look into some other fantastic digital programs. We have our Goldie's Kids Club activities for young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Story series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. Thank you all again. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again on Thursday, May 26th. Thank you again for joining us and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.